Hi there, so today we're going to be going over how to use the robot section of the Kipper Robot Simulator. So you'll notice that in this section right here we have our start location section, which is what we're going to go over first. And each of these little sections is collapsible, so you can click on them and they'll collapse and unclaps. So you can do that with every single one of these sections. So for the start location, the first button we've got right here is this refresh button. And the refresh sets the robot back to where it was supposed to start. So anytime you click that, it'll set it back to whatever this position right here is. And so to talk about these different coordinates right here, we have our X, Y, and our Z. And so all of these have their own units. So I can change this one to inches, or I could change this one to feet. They can all be their own different units. You may want them all in inches or something like that. So say I wanted the robot to start a little bit farther forward. So say I wanted this to start 10 inches forward. I can change that to 10, hit enter, and the robot will start all the way up here, which is 10 inches from where it originally was at. We can also do this for the y direction. So if you want it to start higher up, you can change it there. Of course, it's going to fall back down. Um, if we wanted this to be further to its left, for example, I might make this a negative 10 instead. So that way the robot starts all the way over here. Notice each time I change this position, it sets it to whatever the all of these coordinates are going to be. So if this is at 10 in the air, if I set that each time, it'll start at 10 in the air. So I'm going to change it back to zero. So we always start on the ground. And so the other thing you can change is the rotation. So if I want my robot to start facing a different direction, I could change this to 90 degrees. And now my robot's facing this way. And so you can also change this to radians if you want to. I know most people might not want to, but it's there as an option. So the second section we're going to go over is the servo section. So if we look at the servo section, the main thing we have here is all of our different servos that are on the robot. So the only ones that are actually on the robot that are working are servo ports 0 and 3. So we can show the plots for these servo positions by clicking the show right here. It may or may not be useful to you since most servo positions are set immediately. So most of the time, these plots aren't shown automatically. I'm going to go ahead and hide it. And so whenever we change our servo position, so I'm going to change servo port 0 right here. So I'm going to click Run. It's going to compile. The compilation succeeded, and it flipped it all the way back. And you can see it's kind of moving up and down right there. That's because it's actually hitting something, and that's why it keeps moving back and forth like that. So I'm going to change this to a position that's a little bit easier for it, where it's not hitting something. I'm going to run that now. You also notice that it was at position 0 right here. So we changed it to 100 here. Whenever we ran it, it also moved it to the position over here. So that's how the servo section works. So the next section that we're going to go over is the motor velocity section. And so for the motor velocities, uh, once again, we only have ports 0 and 3 on here. And so these are just going to tell us how fast the motors are actually moving. So let's go ahead and run a program and see how it works. So it's going to compile, get accomplished and succeeded, and it starts moving the motors. And so we'll notice that it's saying that it's moving at a speed of 750 right there. And over here, we've got it moving at 50% power. And so 50% power is actually going to be 750 ticks per second. And so that just means that that's on those rotations right there on the motors. It's got 1,500 ticks in one rotation. And so if we're doing it 50% power, it's only going to move at half that speed. And so the speed it's moving at is going to be 750. And so you can also change these plots right here. And so if you want to show what speed the motors are moving at, see that right here. This might be helpful if you've got motors that are changing over time in your program for some reason. You can always just leave them off by default. So that's how you use the motor velocity section. So now we're going to take a look at the motor position section. And so for motor positions, um, we'll notice that we have from our previous example that it's already changed a little bit right here. But so whenever we run our program, 
we can see that our motor position counter, which is the function that's running right here, goes up as we run our motors. And so it's just going to display whatever that motor position is going to be at. So it's going to run for 10 seconds there. So I'm going to go ahead and stop it, and reset its position. And so you can always clear the motor position counter inside of your code right here. So I'm going to clear it for port zero. And I'm just going to give it a little bit of time in order to actually clear that. Give this a shot real quick and watch this get motor position counter right here. Piling, compilation scheme, and notice how it reset back to zero. And so this one's way up where it was before because we didn't clear that one, but this one went back down because we cleared that one before we ran. That's how your get motor position counter is going to work. Once again, you can click this little icon right here. If you want to view this motor position counter over time, if you watch this run really quick. So notice I'm on port one right here, so nothing's happening. But if I go up here to port zero, we can see that it's going straight up as we go along. And that's just because it's moving at a constant speed. Go ahead and stop it. And then it plateaus at the spot that it was at before. So that's how you use the motor position section. So the next section that we're going to go over is the analog sensor section. So in the analog sensors, we only have analog sensors 0 and 1 hooked up. And analog 0 is going to be hooked up to our rangefinder sensor right here. And analog 1 is going to be hooked up to the reflectance sensor right here. And so the rangefinder, it can tell the distance between objects and itself. And the reflectance sensor right here can tell the difference between black and white. And so one thing that may be useful to you is looking at these analog sensor plots, as we can actually kind of see the sensor values change over time as they're being read, and we can see their values right here. And so let's go ahead and run a program just so we can see how this rangefinder sensor changes over time. So we're going to click Run. Compile, and it's going to move slowly towards it. And you'll notice this line right here on the plot is going up slowly. Once it hits it, eventually the can gets pushed out of the way, and you'll see this big drop right here. That's because it's no longer actually sensing the can. And so I'm going to go ahead and hide this plot right here. You'll notice it's changing just a little bit right here, and that's because it's got nothing to actually focus on. And so it's kind of out here in midair, not really seeing anything in particular. And that's why we're getting these kind of fluctuating values right here. So you can mess with it around with the reflectance sensor with, by yourself if you want, um, but that's how the analog sensor section works. So the last section that we're going to go over is going to be the digital sensor section. And so for the digital sensors, we only have ports 0, 1, and 2 connected. So port 0 is connected to our lever sensor right here, and ports 1 and 2 are connected to our two sen touch sensors right here on the back. So we're actually going to use this lever sensor right here and see what happens when it touches a can. So I'm going to go ahead and pop up can 6 right here. And so let's go ahead and run our program and see what happens. So digital sensors are only ever 0 or 1. And so whenever this hits, we should see this turn to a 1. Yep, and there we go. And the can fell over and it's not touching it anymore, so now it's back to 0. And so that's kind of exactly what we expect from the digital sensors. They're either touched or they're not touched. Uh, you can actually use the digital sensor plot right here if you want to. I personally don't because it's either a 0 or a 1, on or off. But it's up to you if you decide to use it. But that's all there is to it, to use the digital sensors.